In this video, I'm going to be talking about my Milliard Viper V10 motorcycle that I made in 2009, show you how I made some of the parts and talk about some of its features. And then in part two, we're going to do the pre-flight checks and take it for a ride. The first thing I had to do was buy an 8 litre V10 Dodge Viper engine on eBay and pick it up in my Series 2A Land Rover. That was a tight fit. And here's the engine sat on my garage floor. It weighs 750 pounds. I bought a 90 degree bevel box to bolt to the back of the engine, then made a single sided swing and arm. I over engineered a lot of things, making brackets from inch thick steel by chain drilling, then machining up on my Miller machine to get the desired shape. Here's a swing and arm mountain bracket. The front sprocket is concentric with the swing and arm pivot, so the suspension has no effect on the chain tension. I had to make the forks from scratch because there was nothing available that was big enough to suit the bike. I had the lower stanchions hard chromed and ground to size. The yokes were made from two inch thick aluminium, chain drilled out, then machined on my milling machine. The lower fork stanchion is actually a JCB hydraulic ram with heavy duty spring and a Vauxhall Carlton internal strut damper just on one side. Here I am machining the outer fork legs on my old Myford ML7 model maker's lathe. They only just fitted and I had to machine them half at a time. With all the parts machined, I assembled the forks ready for the next stage. Before I could fit the forks, I had to remove all the unwanted ancillaries from the front of the engine and make up a special subframe. The bike has no frame as such, just a front subframe and the rear swinging arm pivots directly on the output shaft from the gearbox so the engine is a fully stressed member. And here's the rear wheel, swinging arm, bevel box and clutch bell housing connected up to the V10 engine. I then welded on two vertical struts to hold two Yamaha R1 shock absorbers. But the springs were a bit soft but that was easily rectified by fitting some springs from a Ford Escort they fitted just perfect and looked great. I made the bike in sub-assemblies that could be easily taken apart so I could work on them. Here's the rear sub-assembly. Because the bike has a single speed transmission and a manual clutch, there is no provision for a neutral. So I made this little lever that operates a mechanism that puts a wedge in behind the clutch to prevent it from operating if I want a neutral position. And when the clutch is disengaged, it's physically impossible for it to accidentally re-engage, which is a good safety point. I fitted a lightweight aluminium flywheel and a 12 inch clutch with an 1100 pound spring, so it takes three separate hydraulic circuits to operate. The clutch lever was very hard to pull in, so I linked in a foot pedal as well and a two to one vacuum servo. The primary master cylinders from a Honda motorcycle and I made the slave cylinder that's operated by the foot pedal to assist with a special custom lever. And here's the three reservoirs. The first one's for the hydraulic clutch lever, the second one's for the intermediate clutch booster and the third one is for the foot pedal assist. And behind this cover I have a 60 amp alternator and my 2.8 to 1 clutch assist vacuum booster. The system works really well. When the engine's running with the vacuum booster working, I can operate the clutch by hand or by foot or for any really easy life, both together. As you can imagine, the exhaust system gets very hot. I've actually had them ceramic coated and made these little stainless steel heat shield covers, but I ran into a problem. The heat shield covers didn't work that great. Hello? Is that NASA? It is. Great. Now, this is a bit of a long shot really, but I was wondering, would you sell me one of your space shuttle re-entry tiles for my motorbike? I'm making this heat shield. What, you won't? Not, not, not even one? Oh, okay. Never mind. Well, thanks for your time. Bye. I did a bit of research online and I found out that these fake coals used on gas fires are very similar to space shuttle tiles. 
And you can pick them up on the outside and they're stone cold, but the other side's glowing red hot. So I thought, what if I can shave a little bit off this and stick it to the inside of my stainless steel covers? And I wonder if that'll work. So Tracy was out shopping and I thought, I'll just trim a few bits off, she won't notice. And then we just stuck it, stick it onto a piece of stainless to try and it worked perfect. And that's what I did. And here's a thin sliver, less than five millimeters thick on my finger with my map gas blowtorch. It's probably about 1300 degrees C and I can't feel a thing. And then when I remove the heat, it's instantly cold. So I thought this is absolutely perfect, just the job. So this is what I did on a bit of scrap steel. I used some of this Permatex Ultra Grey, which is like a silicone adhesive silica sealant. Stuck that to the back of the actual ceramic tile and pressed it onto the inside of my heat shield. And then I repeated this with loads of little bits, bits of this um, material until the whole inner surface was covered. Just like that. And here is my original heat shield and it's over 11 years old and works perfect. When I made the seat for the bike, I wanted it to be interchangeable with my racing seat and have a quick release mechanism. So I made these two mushroom shaped protrusions that engage with a quick release mechanism operated by a lever on the side underneath the frame tube. When the lever is pulled, the mechanism releases the protrusions and the seat can be easily removed. And to put it back on the bike, you just put it over the top and press down in the middle and it's on. No nuts and bolts and no spanners. With such a heavy bike, it's important to have a stand for every occasion. So I've got a left-hand side stand, a right-hand side stand and a centre stand. And I can put it on the centre stand on my own without assistance using my ratchet system. A two-way ratchet is attached to a shaft on the centre stand that engages with half a gear. This allows me to use another ratchet to wind the centre stand down in a controlled manner to lift the bike off the ground at the back. The centre stand ratchet lever is stowed underneath the seat and fits like this. But first I have to set the ratchet on the centre stand to allow it to come down. With the stand down resting on the road, I then place the lever onto the sand and adjust the ratchet on that to allow me to pump it down further with my foot. It's quite a simple operation. You just push it down with your foot, lift it back up with your toe, push it down with your foot until the bike is off the ground and on the stand. This bike weighs 630 kilograms and I can do it with one foot. To take the bike off the stand, the first thing you do is reverse the ratchet on the centre stand, reverse the ratchet on the lever, put the lever back on at the front this time, like that. At this point, I apply the front brake, remove the lever from the stand, put down the side stand, and then gently release the front brake, and the bike rolls forward off the center stand onto the side stand. The lever and the ratchet on the centre stand is part of an old ratchet spanner, a 27mm. And here is the right hand side stand. The rear chain has its own chain oiler based on a Kawasaki H2 system where you have a plunger that you pull out and it dispenses a little bit of oil down via these two little nozzles directly onto the chain while I'm riding. Under the seat, I have a little oil tank for the chain lube. I use ZX1 Extra Lube because it's great on chains. And here, I have the metering device that adjusts the amount of oil that's displaced. So you move this lever from back to front, from a lot to a little. I generally have it about halfway. The V10 engine makes a lot of heat, so I had to have a good cooling system. I fitted two radiators the pre-radiator down the side of the engine behind the headers with twin electric fans behind, an electric water pump and a big radiator at the front. I've ridden the bike over 9,000 miles on the road, including through heavy traffic in London and over 200 miles an hour at Bruntingthorpe airstrip without any overheating issues. So my cooling system is working great. So I'm well pleased with that. The rear brake is from a Metro 6R4 rally car and it's over 300 millimetres diameter and about 35 millimetres thick. 
and the caliper is a Pretex 6 pot. And with the wheel removed, you can see the size of the disc. The rear sprocket is really quick and easy to change, and I have a selection that gives me top speeds from 160 to 260 miles an hour at 6,000 revs. When I made the exhaust silencers, I was inspired by my 1998 TL1000S, but these are straight through three inch absorption types, which sound just perfect with the Viper V10 engine. Under the rear cowl is the engine management system computer that controls the ignition timing and the fuel injection. It's fully programmable by a laptop computer. I made the rear cowl from 1.6mm sheet steel and I cut the two holes in the back to fit 2009 Honda Fireblade rear lights. The tank is also made from 1.6mm steel, flat bottomed and holds 10 gallons of petrol and has an internal high pressure high flow petrol pump. I left a gap beneath the tank to allow the air to exit from the engine when it's going along the road. This aids cooling. I made the tank by welding together lots of little pre-shaped parts, then turning it upside down and hammering it out with a hammer to the desired shape. The whole lot was then ground down smooth and given to my friend Neil for painting. And here it is with the bottom welded on. The finished tank was painted in candy metallic red with the white stripe, similar to a Dodge Viper. The handlebar controls are conventional motorcycle with a twist grip throttle. In fact, the switch gear is actually from a TL1000S and the hydraulic master cylinder of the front brakes from a Honda Pan European and they work perfect. In the center, I've got my own iPhone holder for my sat nav with its charging port. This is perfect when you're on a road trip so you can see where you're going. And on the left side is a conventional TL1000S switch gear, but I have one addition I have a little switch to change the map in the computer to make it backfire, which is fun. And at the front of the tank, I have my Honda SS50 inspired sticker to remember to preserve nature and always wear a crash helmet. The dash comprises of a Coso Speedo and a Coso voltmeter. I also have a USB charger for my phone. And here you can see my mileage just over 9,000 miles since I made the bike. You can scan through the button for several things like trip A and trip B, maximum speed recorded, 189, that's the last time I rode it at Elvington. The air filters are forward facing, which gives it some sort of a ram air effect at speed. They are made by K&N and clamp directly to the throttle bodies, one each side. I made the handlebar risers quite high to give it an acceptable reach for road riding, but if I remove that block and drop the handlebars back to there and then put the top clamp on, it's much better for getting down over the tank at places like Elvington when you want to go fast. The front brake is a 355mm diameter by 35mm wide single sided disc made out of Meonite, normally fitted to a Porsche racing car. Then I fitted twin six pot pre tech calipers and I made titanium pistons, titanium heat shields, and EBC sent me down some special ceramic racing pads, and the brake is absolutely phenomenal. This is the titanium bar in my lathe when I was machining the pistons. Here's the part finished pistons. And here are the finished pistons in the calipers ready for reassembly. Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. If you've got any questions you'd like to ask, leave a comment and I'll try and answer it in the next video. And next time, I'm going to be doing some pre-flight checks, starting the engine and taking it out for a ride. And there could even be some clips from Elvington and the Isle of Man. Oh yeah, and don't forget to like and subscribe.